Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg UK. I'm Francie Lacroix here in London. Now, the UK government has frequently said it wants to put the country at the center of artificial intelligence, both in terms of research and regulation. Now, one of the firms that is at the cutting edge of this technology, of course, is DeepMind, a London-based startup which was bought by Google in 2014. Now, in just a moment, we'll bring you our exclusive interview with the company's chief executive and co-founder, Demis Asabis. He shares his view on how the UK is positioned for the future of the technology. But first, the company also says its first AI-designed drugs may be ready for testing in the next couple of years, a breakthrough that could also be worth more than $100 billion. Well, of course, the holy grail for drug discovery is not just knowing the protein structure, which is what AlphaFold 2 did, but actually designing drug compounds called ligands that bind to the protein surface. And you want to know where it binds and how strongly it binds in order for you to design the, the right kind of drug compound. So AlphaFold 3 is a, a big step in that direction of um, predicting protein ligand binding and how that interaction will work. Given the technology you, know how, you now have at your fingertips and everything you know about how this is progressing, what is your best guess as to, as to what will be the first AI derived and discovered drug. Yeah. Well, we, we announced earlier on this year um, some big partnerships with Eli Lilly and, and Novartis. Uh, so we're already working on, on real drug uh, programs. Uh, and I would be expecting maybe in the next couple of years the first AI sort of designed drugs uh, in the clinic. Well, Demis Hassabis also spoke uh, to Tom McKenzie about the UK's government AI safety summit last year and the future of artificial intelligence in the country. I think it is moving at pace, and I'm very pleased to, to, to see, you, you know, uh, government and civil service sort of embracing that. And I think the, the summit was a huge success. Uh, and obviously there's the next one in Korea and then the one next after that in Paris. Um, and but the UK specifically? Yeah. Uh, there's more that we can do it. And there's examples of a data center that, that were plans to build it on the outskirts of Oxford. Yeah. And it was essentially nixed by the Secretary of State in, in charge because essentially didn't look good. But we need those data centers would be the proponents of generative AI. And we need to reform our planning laws. Is that a roadblock for the UK? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know about that specific case. But, but in general, we've got to make sure um, we embrace the en enormous opportunity that AI represents. Mm. And... Um, uh, the enormous economic opportunity for startups and business and, 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 and embrace that quickly and get on board with that quickly, as well as uh, also for our uh, infrastructure and services, you know, things like the, the health service, I think, um, can benefit from these technologies and, and, and allow them to be more efficient and, 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 and uh, more performative and more productive. So I think there's enormous opportunity. We have the intellectual capital here. We have, you know, uh, lots of leading companies here. We need to make the most of that. And, and I think government government needs to, to embrace that, mm. as well as the responsibility side, which I think the summit was about too. So I yeah. think both are important, and we, we shouldn't lose sight of either. B big election year, of course, for the UK. I'm not going to push you on your, on your political colours, sure. Demis. But do you think, are you confident that the Labour Party, who of course have a huge polling advantage right now, are invested, as invested in AI as the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak claims to be? I feel like from the conversations I've had, you know, um, both parties are uh, understand this this enormous opportunity and 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 the responsibility that goes along with that um, that's coming up and the and the, the incredible potential AI has. So I feel pretty confident about the you know the discussions I've had with with officials from both parties. Mm. Well, that was an exclusive interview with the Google DeepMind chief executive and co-founder, Demis Hassabis. Now, let's bring in Bloomberg's Mark Bergen to discuss some of the themes of that exclusive interview in the UK tech sector more broadly. So, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, you live and breathe this every day. This is like your beat. You report on it. Is, is he right? To, is there, we know from the chancellor that actually they want to try and make this economy, the UK, a kind of Silicon Valley. And what are the chances of, of that being really true? Uh, I mean, it's certainly Demis's presence here and DeepMind's presence is a, is a big part of that. And I think he's fully aware of that. Uh, he's just knighted recently. So, Sir Demis, actually. Um, and, I, I mean, he clearly has been a, a leading figure. He was part of this AI safety summit. Um, it, is a, it is a talent mecca in part because of DeepMind and their work around life sciences. And there's drawing in a lot more. We're seeing new biotech companies and life sciences companies. It's sort of one of the strong suits uh, of the sector in, in the U.K. Uh, the flip side, and we've seen this this past past few weeks and, and month, really, um, is that you're seeing companies like Darktrace kind of leaving the stock exchange. You're seeing GraphCore, which is that we talked about yesterday, the, uh, the chip company in Bristol, well, once sort of the, the, 
new kind of AI champions valued over three, near, nearly $3 billion. Looks like it's going to sell to SoftBank for much less than that. Uh, and you're seeing a lot of companies really struggle to break through and become the sort of AI superpowers that, that the um, Prime Minister has talked about. But so, so again, what are the underlying you know, causes of that? I know there's also Julia Hoggett at the London Stock Exchange trying to, to do a lot of work and trying to revitalize the capital markets, maybe make it easier for, for some of these companies to list here and not go elsewhere. But is there, a, is there a concern that actually there's just not enough investment coming into the country? Does the you know, UK ISA make a difference or is it something more structural? Uh, a lot a lot of investors that talk, at least the venture capitalists, talk about this sort of dearth of capital at the growth stage for UK companies, right? A lot of companies, and not just in UK, but in Europe across, are, are looking when, when they're growing at a certain stage, at kind of early, like Series B, uh, they're looking to US investors. There's just not enough money. One of the issues has been uh, pension reform that's talked about a lot here in, in London, uh, kind of unlocking that money that's, that's certainly in the US and Canada and Australia, other countries and, and others in, in, in Europe have proven to be a bit primary source of venture capital. Um, I think that there's there's a lot of people, you know, they talk about a lot in the industry of the ecosystem issue where you, you don't have as many successful companies kind of seeding new new founders uh, and new companies. That's just starting to happen, in, in, especially in spaces like biotech and life sciences, but that takes a lot of time. Yeah, but, but is this up to big companies to put that investment in, or is it just also kind of retail investors that don't go into the markets like they do in the U.S.? I mean, we've seen Microsoft recently made a big investment here in London. Or at least, at least they said they're opening up a, a, a London office. Unclear how much of that is actually be a, yeah. a big investment. On the retail side, you know, it's the startups I talk to. It's not many of them have this priority about listing here, unless you know the only reason, the only rationale I heard is is kind of patriotism in some sense, sort of like you will be. Uh, you know, I talked to a software and a kind of a, a software company that that might be IPO in the next few years. He said it can have a much bigger market cap and much bigger retail investors in the U.S. If here, probably has a chance of getting knighted. So Arm, I mean, it's not a bad, I don't know if that's, if that's yeah. a, good, a good carrot, but For you know, sure. it's something. Sir Mark, would you like the sound of that? Um, Arm shares actually are, are falling after the company um, didn't give a, a great annual forecast. I mean, this was, you know, the jewel in the crown actually of the U.K., but they decided to list elsewhere. Right. I mean, I, and, and this was, I think, more indicative of, of what we're seeing potentially of, uh, of a slowdown or at least uh, of this really this this the past year and a half around AI and this enthusiasm around AI. I think that the rubber is meeting the road in the sense of like, OK, now where's the demand for actual AI services? Like who what companies are actually paying for that? And our might be a leading indicator in some sense if that's it's not going to be necessarily as big as a lot of the growth potential. I mean, to be clear, like their, their business is still is still pretty strong. And I think they're kind of moving into data centers in a really interesting way. Uh, and there's a lot of potential there. Um, I, I think at, at Arm is a really interesting case of like where if they're going to be seeding talent, are we going to see a lot of people leaving Arm and starting companies here in the UK? That's a really interesting question. Uh, Mark, I mean, some people say, look, it's it's not a great idea to be a UK company and list elsewhere. But is Arm even a UK company? Is it still considered a UK company? Well, I've considered a 90% SoftBank company. So, <laughs> but, um, uh, I don't. I mean, I think most of their team. I, I, I sit here, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but you know, at this point, like the listing there, the SoftBank ownership. Um, it's sort of hard to yeah. identify as a, as a British company. Yeah, biotech, I mean, is that, I know that, you know, you have GlaxoSmithKline, you have, and actually GlaxoSmithKline are also moving, I think, offices to be closer to, to Google and DeepMind, um, you know, at King's Cross. Does that make a difference to the ecosystem? I think so. I mean, certainly you have proponents in that kind of King's Cross, kind of that uh, new square mile, talking a lot about the, the research potential there. You're having these new companies. Um, like I said, Earlier, biotech is, is a really fast. There's certainly a like, university system in the UK. There's, there's a, a little bit funding, but there's still a shortage of funding. But these are companies that take years, if not decades, to really fully come to fruition and, and build sustainable businesses. I mean, Demis talked about building uh, isomorphic labs at Alphabet Unit into a, a hundred, more than $100 billion business. Alphabet's one of the few companies that has the time and the patient capital to do that. He didn't say, he didn't give a timeline for that in the interview today. So my sense is that that's not, not happening next year. So interesting. Mark, thank you so much. Mark Bergen, they're, of course, uh, looking at startups and the ecosystem here in the UK on the very latest with DeepMind. Now, coming up, money markets on edge as the Bank of England aggressively tries to clear its balance sheet of bonds. We discuss the challenges facing the governor, Andrew Bailey, ahead of our interview a little bit later. This is Bloomberg.
Now, the Bank of England has money markets on edge about QT or quantitative tightening, with the cost of obtaining sterling cash hitting the highest level in three years by several metrics. Now, investors are really waiting to see if the central bank provides further guidance in a few hours from now on its policy meeting. Well, let's discuss all of this with John Stepek, author of the newsletter Money Distilled. It's very good. Everyone should have subscribed by now. If not, this is a perfect time to do it. And Marcus Ashworth from Bloomberg Opinion. You should also subscribe uh, to Marcus Columns. Thank you both for joining us. John, when you look at the Bank of England, I know there's so much focus on rates, yeah. but actually sometimes we forget about QT or we don't talk about it as much, but it's a really powerful tool. Yeah, it is. And I mean, I think what, what's most interesting here is that on the one hand, we're talking about interest rates and we're talking about interest rates going down. So everyone's thinking, oh, when's the cut coming? When's the cut coming? And at the same time, the bank is actually, you know, technically tightening monetary policy by going doing quantitative tightening, which is the opposite of quantitative easing. And so there's a little bit of a contradiction in terms there. And obviously, we're now seeing some stresses kind of building up in the markets as a result of that. But but is this, John? And I want to get to Marcus in a second because he also think he thinks the BOE should tailgate the ECB, not the Fed. But is this a way of calibrating it? Because if you look at inflation expectations, so sure they dip, but they're not expected to go up. So by using these two tools, I mean it's a bit like landing on a plane on you know a, a string, but it could work, or could it not? It could work. But the problem I've got is that quantitative tightening. Um, for a start, the Bank of England is doing this, and actually the, the Fed and the ECB are doing far less aggressive versions of it. Um, and the other issue with the QT is that it's actually becoming something of a political issue as well, because actually this is kind of a form of fiscal tightening. If the bank stopped doing QT, then Jeremy Hunt would have an extra £10 billion to spend this year, according to a, a kind of recent piece by one of our colleagues, Phil Aldrich. So you're actually it, kind of affecting the public finances as well in a way that's very public now. I mean, it, it was fine during QE because the government was getting lots of extra money to spend, but now that money's getting sucked out, it becomes much more of a political issue. Yeah. And the bank needs to communicate over that, uh, I think, much more clearly than perhaps it has. Marcus, do you agree? Uh, yeah, look, I think the whole point about uh, the Bank of England is that they did a far greater percentage of, of GDP, and, and most of their whole uh, monetary easing was related to uh, building up a massive bond, you know, government bond uh, portfolio. So they've been the most aggressive in unwinding it, and they're doing the only one that's doing what's known as active QT, which is for actual real sales of bonds going out to, you know, 50 years or whatever, back into the market. And that's the problem here. This is what's causing huge losses. And I've been, well, I've been very vociferous about, about this being a, a, an actively very bad policy, which is filtered through uh, a bunch of other commentators, I'm sure, picked up on this as well, including notably Mervyn King. And I think that's what's altering the, the Bank of England's uh, mindset. So I suspect in September, when they will, uh, in August, sorry, they, they will formally review it I think they may well drop the active part. Uh, it only uh, really requires 10 billion for the next following year, rather than 50 this year. Yeah. Because actual passive runoffs are so large, they could quietly drop it and and uh, and move on. And I think and hope that's what the market will, will want and to see. As yeah. far as money markets right here are concerned, it's just a little bit of tightness. I'm sure they can manage it. As we saw through the uh, mini budget sort of crisis. LDI, guild crisis, they've got lots of different mechanisms to pump liquidity in as and when is needed. So I don't see a real problem here. I just hope they surprise us at midday and they cut interest rates. But to, to both of you, I mean, that's not the, the base case at the moment, but to, to both of you, and maybe, John, you know, we start with you, what, what grade would you give to the Bank of England right now on a report card? Because some people are saying, look, what they're doing with QT is not right. Others are saying there's maybe an undue haste to cut rates, given that, you know, the, the inflation only falls temporarily to 2% and then shoots back up. I mean, a central bank's main job is communicating. Um, and I probably feel that the Bank of England is doing poorly on that at the moment. Um, because, you know, overall, uh, part of the problem is that central banks, we, we give them this sense that they, or we have this sense that they are in control of all of this stuff, and they really aren't. I mean, they're, they're so, it, it's, you, you could debate the whole purpose of a central bank if you really wanted to. Yeah. But in the absence of, uh, you know, conviction about what they're actually doing, 
then I yeah. think that you, they have to explain what they're doing yeah. better. And I don't think they're great at doing that at the moment. But John, I mean, is there? A, I mean, they're not omnipotent, but they kind of, you know, they're steering the economy, right, quietly in a non-political sense. Uh, well, it's, it's, I mean, if you think about it, it's mad that every single month, roughly, we yeah. all sit here and debate what the bank may or may not do and may or may not say and how that's going to affect global capital markets. You know, it's, it's, kind of, it's, it's a weird form of central planning that you've got nine people sitting around a room and, like, what they do or don't yeah. do actually moves markets. Yeah. You know, it's like, why does this have any effect on the price of GSK, for example, just because, you know, Andrew Bailey raised his eyebrow in a certain direction? But it, it does. I love John. <laughs> this is why we have him on. He's going all, like, Malay on me. Marcus, I mean, what's your take? Well, it's a family show, so I probably shouldn't say it, but I just think John's been very harsh on the lovely Bank of England, wonderful people with marvellous insights and fabulous econometric models, which I can only admire and respect. I think they okay. are. Okay, Marcus, but, at this, but look, I mean, the, the concern, Marcus, is that, and actually to both of you, is that you wouldn't want it to be political. I mean, if this, if, if this then gets, you know, maybe we have more running commentary, is it political? But they're in, they're, they wouldn't never, I mean, they would never, they'd, ne they'd really push back hard against that because they're meant to be independent. Yeah, well, their independence in some sense is political. And certainly if you look back to the mini budget and how they escape blame, I would say Bailey is world class at one thing, which was beautifully transferring all the blame onto uh, Liz Truss, who deserved a lot of the blame, don't get me wrong. But I certainly think the Bank of England played a part in their lack of, uh, of knowledge of what was going on in the gilt market prior and their introduction of active QT right into the mini budget uh, and refusal to, to do anything about, uh, should we say, tightening and, and overly tightening uh, when gilt yields are rising very rapidly or uh, going into all yeah. these things. So politically, it's, you know, obviously we want it not to be political. They clearly want it not to be political. But unfortunately, for whatever reason, they became very political. And we certainly saw during the start of the pandemic and uh, when we were pumping back in QE, that the Bank of England mirrored exactly what the government was doing. I mean, literally pound for pound. So in some senses, it's very hard to separate away a, a central bank. And I think there, is, there should be some political overlap. It shouldn't be treated as some sacrosanct independent thing. I think they need to be a little bit more conducive, particularly with regard to what John was saying earlier and how the impact on fiscal policy is affecting us all by the huge losses they are racking up in active QT. I mean, I still think the government actually sets the target, but th this will be continued. And I have a feeling that both Marcus's column and John's newsletter today will be pretty explosive. So I would read it. Bloomberg's Marcus, Bloomberg Opinions, Marcus Ashworth and John Stepek stays with us. Coming up, we also find out why London is losing thousands of shoppers to Paris, Milan and Madrid. That's next. And this is Bloomberg. Now, thousands of tourists who used to travel to Britain for tax-free shopping are now visiting stores in Paris, Milan and Madrid. This after the UK scrapped a tax incentive for overseas visitors. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Bloomberg's Jennifer Creary and John Stepek is still with us. So, um, Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, why was this actually scrapped in, in the UK in the first place? Yeah, so the UK uh, made the decision to scrap this back in 2020. You know, when the UK left the European Union, there was a discussion of whether or not to extend this regime to European Union visitors or scrap it entirely. And the government concluded that uh, it would simply be too costly to extend the regime. Uh, and so, you know, in, in a subsequent OBR report, uh, they estimated that the government could save you know, more than £400 million by scrapping this regime. And so the government ultimately decided to do so. But of course, this has come at the expense of many of these uh, British retailers that say now that they're really feeling the pain. Yes, yeah, so, so I was going to ask you what are businesses saying? So if you speak like someone like Burberry or some of the others, can they just book the sales in Paris and it doesn't make that much of a difference to their revenue? Yeah, so the ones that are really feeling this are the ones with uh, big exposure in the UK who really rely on tourists who come in, this particularly, you know, international tourists that come, that fly in from afar to spend their money in, say, London, you know, these tourist hubs. So, for example, Mulberry, the British handbag maker, uh, they specifically highlighted the removal of this uh, uh, VAT 
tax-free shopping regime uh, for a dip in its UK sales at the end of last year when it otherwise had a pretty good year. So these, these brands are saying, you know, this is really impacting us. I mean, it's impacting John's shopping, right? Always in Paris for, the, for Louis Vuitton yeah. <laughs> and the rest. What's your take, John? Because, again, so they're bringing money in, but you basically lose an ecosystem where shoppers come in and go to restaurants. And so I don't know whether it's, it's worth it. I mean, they're saying this is even, you know, a worse downfall for the UK, the survey says, than the cost of living crisis. The problem is it's quite a, it's quite a hard sell. Um, I mean, for a start, you know, all due respect to retailers, but you're never going to hear them calling for higher prices or higher interest rates. So there is an element of lobbying here. Um, also, you know, the OBR, which, uh, as we all know, its word is, you know, is God, um, has said that even if you account for the tourist impact, you're still saving, like, nearly half a billion a year. And half a billion is quite a lot of money yeah. these days, uh, given that we're trying to scrimp and save at, yeah. at various other areas. So it's hard to say, oh, why don't we give a tax cut yeah. to a load of rich foreigners to buy luxury goods whenever, you know, there's a lot of people kind of wanting taxes cut in other areas first. Yeah, so is Labour's position any different on this? Yeah, so it's not on the agenda for either of the two main political parties uh, ahead of the upcoming general election. And so, you know, British retailers, hope is fading for them for a change in this regime anytime soon. And, you know, the Conservative government considered this issue to be dealt with. They've already reviewed it. And so it seems like that's not going to change anytime soon for retailers. Jennifer, thank you so much. Uh, Jennifer Creary there and John Stepik. Thank you both for coming on the program. Now, a reminder to subscribe, first of all, to John's newsletter, Money Distilled, for a look at the world of markets and economics and what it all means for your money. Also, be sure to subscribe to Bloomberg's In the City podcast. I host that with Allegra Stratton and Dave Merritt as we uncover the best stories and speak to the people in the know about financial centers across the world. This is Bloomberg.